Thank you very much indeed, Simon. Um, and a good evening to everyone. Yes, I am Laurence Roussillon Constanti, and I am professor in um, British literature, 19th century literature and arts and epistemology at the University of Pau et des Pays de la Dour, uh, which is in the southwest of France, not too far from Toulouse and close to the Pyrenees. Um, this is the second reading of, um, of Ruskin and the Crafts series. Um, a cycle organized, as you heard, by the Guild of St. George. Um, the first reading offered wonderful readings on architecture and arts, and today's evening will be devoted to textile. And we hope that, although this is a virtual event, you will enjoy the way we have tried weaving together the many threads of Ruskin's idea on textile in text, since the word textile comes from textilis, which means woven in Latin, but also in image, as most of his words invite the reader to envision the world in all its dimensions and indeed expand our daily lives through craft and all things creative. In order to explore this very rich theme of textile and demonstrate how the lesser arts, as William Morris called them, could lead to a better way of experiencing the world around us. We are very lucky to have three speakers this evening and a very international panel. Our first speaker, and here perhaps we can have the next slide so you can see them, a picture of them, I mean, uh, Simon. Um, our first speaker, Tess Darwin, who has rooted down in Falkland in Scotland, um, is an embroiderer whose artistic work you'll be able to discover in the course of tonight's talk. Tess is a retired ecologist and environmental educator with a lifelong interest in arts, crafts, and the natural world. In 1996, she published a book, The Scots Herbal, on traditional uses of wild plants on Scotland. Since retiring a few years ago, she has been developing her skills in textile art and hand stitching with repurposed materials, which is now her main occupation. She has participated in several group exhibitions and given regular talks on her work. In fact, the latest one two days ago. The second speaker is Rachel Dickinson, uh, who is a reader in interdisciplinary studies in English at Manchester University and master of the Guild of St. George, who does not know Rachel within our group. Rachel is also, as she pointed out, a textile practitioner, and she enjoys spinning, dyeing, and weaving. Um, finally, our third and most geographically remote speaker tonight is Arjun Jivaji Cheng, and sorry if I mispronounce your name, <laughs> Arjun, uh, who is joining us from the Red House Cultural Center in Delhi that you can see on screen in India, and I would particularly like to thank you, Arjun, uh, for participating to this event at what is a very undue hour, almost midnight on your end. Arjun studied physics at the Indian Institute of Technology in Roorkee, again, sorry about my pronunciation here, um, between 2009 and 2014, and art and science at Central St. Martins in London, in 2015-2016. He has received a number of scholarships and fellowships from the Department of Science, Government of India, um, and has also worked in various capacities across a wide range of fields, apart from science as well. Most prominently, painting and writing. At present, he is Young Companions representative in the Guild of St. George, and runs a cultural center in Delhi by the name of Red House, uh, where he conducts and facilitates various programs every weekend. The architecture of Red House he's been working on for the past six years using lime as a mortar and Ruskin seven lamps as uh, its foundation. Before we start, I should also like to mention 
that I'd be one of the readers tonight. Again, um, I want to introduce myself again, of course, but I just want to emphasize that here, most of all, I'm here as a companion of the guild. And uh, I could, although I couldn't stitch to save my life, I've done a bit of research um, on the connection between needlework and literature. In particular, uh, I'd like to mention I co-edited um, a volume of essays with Rachel Dickinson um, called Converging Lines, Needlework in English Literature and Visual Arts, which you can easily find online. Um, this is an area, um, it's a journal, it's an online journal. Tonight, we will read passages from a wide selection of John Ruskin's work, ranging from his early prose writings to his letters and unto his last, and also from a couple of extracts from other authors that were inspired by Ruskin's ideas. So without further ado, let us start with our first reading. Thank you all for attending this uh, reading tonight. And thank you, Laurence, for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm going to read from Modern Paint Painters, Volume 4, Chapter 11, which is called Of the Materials of Mountains. And Ruskin here is making connections between embroidery, nature and art. I have never had time to examine and throw into classes the varieties of the mosses which grow on the two kinds of rock, nor have I been able to ascertain whether there are really numerous differences between the species or whether they only grow more luxuriantly on the crystallines than on the coherents. But this is certain, that on the broken rocks of the foreground in the crystalline groups, the mosses seem to set themselves, consentfully and deliberately, to the task of producing the most exquisite harmonies of colour in their power. They will not conceal the form of the rock, but will gather over it in little brown bosses, like small cushions of velvet, made of mixed threads of dark ruby silk and gold, rounded over more subdued films of white and grey, with lightly crisped and curled edges, like hoarfrost on fallen leaves and minute clusters of upright orange stalks with pointed caps and fibres of deep green and gold and faint purple passing into black, all woven together and following with unimaginable fineness of gentle growth, the undulation of the stone they cherish, until it is charged with colour so that it can receive no more. And instead of looking rugged or cold or stern as anything that a rock is held to be at heart, it seems to be clothed with a soft, dark leopard skin embroidered with arabesque of purple and silver. For Ruskin, there are parallels between the harmonies of colour and pattern in nature and the natural music of collaborative making. He discusses this in a letter to his mother, Margaret, in 1869. I'm pausing for a slide, but I'll just start reading. Verona, June 18th. Yesterday, it being quite cool, I went for a walk, and as I came down from a rather quiet hillside, a, a mile or two out of town, I passed a house where the women were at work spinning the silk off the cocoons. There was a sort of whirring sound, as in an English mill, but at intervals they sang a long, sweet chant, all together, lasting about two minutes, then pausing a minute, and then beginning again. 
It was good and tender music, and the multitude of voices prevented any sense of failure, so that it was all very lovely and sweet, and like the things that I mean to try to bring to pass. Ruskin referred to that experience a few years later in Forest Clavidra 32, Sandy No of August 1873. And Forest Clavidra is where he's sort of setting out his ideas for what the Guild of St. George will do. And that's what he means by talking about the things he means to try to bring to pass. This letter of Forest Clavidra is largely about Sir Walter Scott. Sandy No was Scott's grandparents' home. 30 miles outside of Edinburgh, where the three-year-old was sent for his health, and as Ruskin puts it, the dawn of conscious life. So in this letter, Sandy Noe of August 1873, we pick up at a point where Ruskin has been praising the exquisite clearness and softness of the Scottish lowland air, as well as natural music of the people and the landscape, notably from pebbles dancing in the water. With the murmur whisper and low fall of these streamlets, unmatched for mystery and sweetness. We must rem remember also the variable, but seldom wild, thrilling of the wind among the recesses of the glens, and, not least, the need of relief from the monotony of occupations involving some rhythmic measure of the beat of foot or hand during the long evenings at the hearthside. In the rude lines describing such passing of hours quoted by Scott in his introduction to the border minstrelsy, you find the grandmother spinning with her stool next to the hearth, for she was old and saw right dimly. Firelight, observe, all that was needed even then. She spins to make a web of good Scots linen. And you show such now from your Glasgow mills. The father is pulling hemp or, or beating it. The only really beautiful piece of song which I heard at Verona during several months stay there in 1869 was the low chant of girls unwinding the cocoons of the silkworm in the cottages among the olive clad hills on the north of the city. Never any in the streets of it. There, only insane shrieks of Republican populace or senseless dance music played by operatic military bands. Roskin, uh, everyone should note Roskin talks never about just one thing, but everything all at once. In this passage from Seven Lamps uh, that I'm going to be reading out, Seven Lamps of Architecture from The Lamp of Sacrifice, he connects the art of spinning. He connects the art of spinning with labor in general and rural landscape. Elsewhere, he quotes Dante, you who judge the earth, give diligent love to justice. And it is very important, the phrasing uh, Ruskin uses, give diligent love to justice. Justice is to be loved and the, and the love needs to be diligent. So from the seven lamps, it is one of the affections of architects to speak of overcharged ornament. Ornament cannot be overcharged if it be good and is always overcharged when it is bad. In all this ornament, there is not one cusp, one finial that is useless. Not a stroke of the chisel is in vain. The grace and luxuriance of it all are visible, sensible rather even to the uninquiring eye. And all its minuteness does not diminish the majesty, while it increases the mystery of the noble and unbroken vault. It is not less the boast of some styles that they can bear ornament than of others that they, that they can do without it. But we do not often enough reflect that those very styles of haughty simplicity owe part of their pleasurableness to contrast and would be wearisome if universal. They are but the rests and monotones of art. It is to its far happier, far higher exaltation 
that we owe those fair fronts of variegated mosaic, charged with wild fancies and dark hosts of imagery, thicker and quainter than ever filled the depth of midsummer dream. Those vaulted gates, trellised with closed leaves, those misty masses of multitudinous pinnacle and diadem tower. The only witness, perhaps, that remained to us of the faith and fear of nations. All else for which the builders sacrificed has passed away. All their living interests and aims and achievements. We know not for what they labored and we see no evidence of their reward. Victory, wealth, authority, happiness, all have departed, though bought by many a bitter sacrifice. Ruskin asks us seriously to consider what is of true lasting value for society. He stresses individual responsibility to take active action. In the 1871 preface to Sesame and Lilies, he considers this in relation to textiles. Again, let a certain part of your day, as little as you choose, but not to be broken in upon, be set apart for making strong and pretty dresses for the poor. Learn the sound qualities of all useful stuffs and make everything of the best you can get, whatever its price. I have many reasons for desiring you to do this, too many to be told just now. Trust me and be sure you get everything as good as can be. And if, in the villainous state of modern trade, you cannot get it good at any price, buy it raw material and set some of the poor women about you to spin and weave till you have got stuff that can be trusted. And then, every day, make some little piece of useful clothing, sewn with your own fingers as strongly as it can be stitched, and embroider it or otherwise beautify it moderately with fine needlework, such as a girl may be proud of having done. And accumulate these things by you until you hear of some honest persons in need of clothing, which may often too sorrowfully be. And even though you should be deceived and give them to the dishonest, and hear of their being at once taken to the pawnbrokers, never mind that, for the pawnbroker must sell them to someone who has need of them. That is no business of yours. What concerns you is only that when you see a half-naked child, you should have good and fresh clothes to give it. What a very affecting passage, Rachel. Thank you. Roskin clarifies further what the value of a thing is. The value of a thing inde independent of quantity or opinion. Economics, of course, is very much related to any discussion on textiles. I speak now from his classic, Unto This Lost. Much store has been set for centuries upon the use of our English classical education. It were to be wished that our well-educated merchants recall to mind always this much of their Latin schooling, that the nominative of valorem a word already sufficiently familiar to them is valor, a word which therefore ought to be familiar to them. Valor from valere, to be well or strong, strong in life if a man or valiant, strong for life if a thing or valuable. To be valuable therefore is to avail towards life. A truly valuable thing or availing thing is that which leads to life with its whole strength. In proportion as it does not lead to life or as its strength is broken, it is less valuable. In proportion as it leads away from life, it is unvaluable or malignant. 
The value of a thing, therefore, is independent of opinion and of quantity. Think what you will of it, gain how much you may of it. The value of the thing itself is neither greater nor less. Forever it avails or avails not. No estimate can raise, no disdain repress the power which it holds from the maker of things and of men. And if in a state of infancy, they supposed in different things, such as excrescences of shellfish and pieces of blue and red stone to be valuable and spent large measures of labor, which ought to be employed for the extension and ennobling of life in diving or digging for them and cutting them into various shapes. Or if in the same state of infancy, they imagined precious and beneficent things such as air, light, and cleanliness to be valueless. Or if finally, they imagined the conditions of their own existence by which alone they can truly possess or use anything such for instance as peace, trust and love to be prudently exchangeable. When the markets offer for gold, iron or excrescences of shells, the great and only science of political economy teaches them. In all these cases, what is vanity and what substance? And how the service of death, the lord of waste and of eternal emptiness differs from the service of wisdom, the lady of saving, and of eternal fullness. And here, perhaps the most important of Ruskin's economic definitions, this really is key. He defines wealth now. Wealth, therefore, is the possession of the valuable by the valiant. And in considering it as a power existing in a nation, the two elements, the value of the thing and the valor of its possessor, must be estimated together. I have hitherto spoken of, of all labor as profitable because it is impossible to consider under one head the quality or value of labor and its same. But labor of the best quality may be various in it. It may be either constructive as agriculture, nugatory as jewel cutting, or destructive as war. It is not, however, always easy to prove labor, apparently nugatory, to be actually so. Generally, the formula holds good. He that gathereth not, scattereth. Thus, the jeweler's art is probably very harmful in its ministering to a clumsy and inelegant pride. Thank you very much, Arjun, for your reading. Um, in line with this view of labor and craft, Ruskin elsewhere details his various schemes towards a collection, including textile, and now we're going to hear Tess tell us about that. In this letter, Ruskin gives textiles primacy of place in his planned St. George's Museum. He speaks of the historical and cultural significance of textiles, including embroidery and dyeing. And he uses the word acicular, meaning a small needle or needle shaped, more commonly a scientific term referring to crystals. He also digresses into a, a remedy for rents, as in the careful mending of torn garments. I find among the materials of fours thrown together long since but never used the following sketch of what the room of the Sheffield Museum set apart for its illustration was meant to contain. All the acicular art of nations, savage and civilized, from Lapland boot letting in no snow water to turkey cushion bossed with pearl to valance of Venice gold in needlework, to the counterpanes and samplers of our own lovely ancestresses. It was but yesterday my own womankind were in much wholesome and sweet excitement, delightful to behold, in the practice of some new device of remedy for rents. 
to think how much of evil there is in the two senses of that four-letter word, as in the two methods of intonation of its synonym, tear or tear. Whereby it might be daintily effaced and with a newness which would never make it worse. The process began, beautiful even to my uninformed eyes, in the likeness of herringbone masonry, crimson on white. But it seemed to me marvellous that anything should yet be discoverable in needle process, and that of so utilitarian character. All that is reasonable, I say, of such work is to be in our first museum room, all that Athena and Penelope would approve. Nothing that vanity has invented for change, or folly loved for costliness. Illustrating the true nature of a thread and a needle, the structure first of wool and cotton, of fur and hair and down, hemp, flax and silk, Microscope permissible here, if anything can be shown, of why wool is soft and fur fine and cotton downy and down downier. And how a flax fibre differs from a dandelion stalk. And how the substance of a mulberry leaf can become velvet for Queen Victoria's crown and clothing of purple for the housewife of Solomon. Then the phase of its dying. What azures and emeralds and Tyrian scarlets can be got into fibres of thread? Then the phase of its spinning, the mystery of that divine spiral from finest to firmest, which renders lace possible at Valenciennes. Then the mystery of weaving, the eternal harmony of warp and woof, of all manner of knotty knitting and reticulation, the art which makes garments possible, woven from the top throughout, drafts of fishes possible, miraculous enough always, when a pilchard or herring shoal gathers itself into companionable catchableness which makes, in fine, so many nations possible, and Saxon and Norman beyond the rest. As we can see, in Ruskin's thought process and writing, dress and cloth become kind of a parable, even when seen in the light of economics. We read again from Unto This Lost. And if on due and honest thought over these things, it seems that the kind of existence to which men are now summoned by every plea of pity and claim of right may for some time at least not be a luxurious one. Consider whether, even supposing it guiltless, luxury would be desired by any of us if we saw clearly at our sides the suffering which accompanies it in the world. Luxury is indeed possible in the future, innocent and exquisite. Luxury for all, and by the help of all. But luxury at present can only be enjoyed by the ignorant. The cruelest man living could not sit at his feast unless he sat blindfold. Raise the veil boldly, face the light. And if, as yet, the light of the eye can only be through tears, and the light of the body through sackcloth, go thou forth weeping, bearing precious seed until the time come and the kingdom when Christ's gift of bread and bequest of peace shall be unto this last as unto thee. And when for earth's severed multitudes of the wicked and the weary, there shall be holy reconciliation in that of the narrow home and calm economy. Where the wicked cease not from trouble, but from troubling, and the weary are at rest. 
Thank you, Arjun. Um, in these beautiful lines that remain ever so eloquent you know, through this lull of the rhythm, I'm sure you've heard, and uh, we see Raskin pleading for a revival tradition as a way for the future at home and abroad. In the Master's Report of 1884, which can be found in the volume of the library edition dedicated to the Guild and Museum of St. George, Roskin looked to past ways of making on a larger scale and of living in community with the focus on textiles. I have said nothing on a subject which is yet of the deepest interest to myself and of much more to many of our companions than any of the matters above considered. The success of Mr. Albert Fleming in bringing back the old industry of the spinning wheel to the homes of Westmoreland, greatly increasing their happiness and effectively their means of support by the sale already widely increasing of the soundest and fairest linen fabrics that care can weave or field do blanch. But of this, and the collateral results obtained by Mr. Ridings in the manufacture of the woolen homespun products of the Isle of Man, now under the direction of our recently appointed second trustee, Mr. Thompson of Huddersfield, he plans to write about in a future letter. The editors of the library edition include a chapter on industrial experiments in connection with St. George's Guild. This is compiled from three reports on the Langdale linen industry, on St. George's cloth made at Laxey on the Isle of Man and the Mr. Ridings just referred to, and on the mill run by George Thompson, also just referred to. And Stuart Eagles has written a really interesting um, article on or booklet um, on Thompson and his mill that was published by the Guild in 2021. Now, to show the connection between Ruskin and textiles, Tess is going to read um, a bit from Albert Fleming's 1890 account of the Langdale linen industry. Amongst the evils resulting from the gradual depopulation of the villages is that round us here in Westmoreland, all the old trades are dying or dead. Bobbin turning, charcoal burning, wood carving, basket making, hand spinning and weaving. Some are clean vanished and others are the mere ghosts of their old selves. My own personal experiment has been to try and reintroduce the hand spinning and weaving of linen. For years past, Mr. Ruskin has been eloquently beseeching English men and maidens once more to spin and weave. Wordsworth, too, melodiously lamented the disuse of the spinning wheel. In the face of all this prevailing ignorance, I determined to try and bring the art back to the Westmoreland women. Scattered about on the fell side were many old women too blind to sew and too old for hard work, but able to sit by the fireside and spin, if anyone would show them how and buy their yarn. When I broached my scheme to a circle of practical relations, a babel of expostulation arose, wild as a parsifal chorus. It won't pay. No one wants linen to last 50 years. It's fantastic, impracticable, sentimental and quixotic. But to balance all this came a voice from Brantwood saying, go ahead. So I went ahead hunted up an old woman who had spun half a century ago and discovered some wheels of a similar period. I got myself taught spinning and then set to work to teach others. We then secured an old weaver 
and one bright Easter morning saw our first piece of linen woven. The first purely hand-spun and hand-woven linen produced in all broad England in our generation. A significant fact that, if you think all around it, over that first 20 yards, the scoffers rejoiced greatly. I own it seemed terrible stuff, frightful in colour and of dreadful roughness with huge lumps and knots meandering up and down its surface. But we took heart of grace and refreshed ourselves by reading that beautiful passage in the Seven Lamps, which convinced us that these little irregularities were really the honourable badges of all true handwork. The passage that Fleming referred to from Ruskin's The Seven Lamps of Architecture is this, from the Lamp of Life. I said early in this essay that handwork might always be known from machine work. Observing, however, at the same time, that it was possible for men to turn themselves into machines and to reduce their labor to the machine level. But so long as men work as men, putting their heart into what they do and doing their best, it matters not how bad workmen they may be. There will be that in the handling which is above all price. It will be plainly seen that some places have been delighted in more than others, that there have been a pause and a care about them. And then there will come careless bits and fast bits, and here the chisel will have struck hard and there lightly and anon timidly. And if the man's mind, as well as his heart, went with his work, all this will be in the right places and each part will set off the other. And the effect of the whole, as compared with the same design cut by a machine or a lifeless hand, will be like that of poetry, well-read and deeply felt, to that of the same verses jangled by rote. There are many to whom the difference is imperceptible, but to those who love poetry, it is everything. They had rather not hear it at all than hear it ill read. And to those who love architecture, the life and accent of the hand are everything. They had rather not have ornament at all than see it ill cut, deadly cut, that is. I cannot too often repeat, it is not coarse cutting, it is not blunt cutting that is necessarily bad, but it is cold cutting. The look of equal trouble everywhere, the smooth diffused tranquility of heartless pains, the regularity of a plough in a level field. The chill is more likely indeed to show itself in finished work than in any other. Men cool and tire as they complete, and if completeness is thought to be vested in polish and to be attainable by help of sandpaper, we may as well give the work to the engine lathe at once. And having spoken of cold cutting, let us fast forward to the year 1941 and travel 4,000 miles east to the coast of Sabarmati in Gujarat, in India. India cut repeatedly as cold as it could be for the past 200 years now. It is fascinating to me how well Gandhiji took to Ruskin's teachings. Gandhiji is to me perhaps the most, the, the, the practical most disciple of Ruskin and of Ruskin's teaching about the spinning wheel in particular. Khadi or handspun cotton and the art of the charkha, the spinning wheel, Gandhi advanced as that panacea for the growing pauperism in India then. It should be noted that the wheel in the center of the Indian flag 
in an earlier version was in fact an entire spinning wheel. To this extent, perhaps Ruskin is important to India's independence. I shall be reading from Gandhi's constructive program. Khadi, handspun cotton, is a controversial subject. Many people think that in advocating Khadi, I am sailing against a headwind and I'm sure to sink the sip of Suraj, self-rule, and that I am taking the country to the dark ages. I do not propose to argue the case for Khadi in this brief survey. I have argued it sufficiently elsewhere. Here, I want to show what every congressman, and for that matter, every Indian, can do to advance the cause of Khadi. It connotes the beginning of economic freedom and equality of all in the country. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. Let everyone try, and he or she will find out for himself or herself the truth of what I am saying. Khadi must be taken with all its implications. It means a wholesale Sudeshi localism mentality a determination to find all the necessaries of life in India, and that too through the labor and intellect of the villagers. It means a reversal of the existing process. That is to say that instead of half a dozen cities of India and Great Britain living on the exploitation and the ruin of 700,000 villages of India, the latter will be largely self-contained and will voluntarily serve the cities of India and even the outside world, insofar as it benefits both parties. This needs a revolutionary change in the mentality and tastes of many. Easy though the non-violent is in many respects, it is very difficult in many others. It vitally touches the life of every single Indian, makes him feel a glow with the possession of a power that is laid hidden within himself and makes him proud of his identity with every drop of the ocean of Indian humanity. This non-violence is not the inanity for which we have mistaken it through these long ages. It is the most potent force as yet known to mankind and on which its very existence is dependent. It is that force which I've tried to present to the Congress and through it to the world. Khadi to me is the symbol of unity of Indian humanity, of its economic freedom and equality, and therefore, ultimately, in the poetic expression of Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister of India, the livery of India's freedom. Thank you so much, Arjun, for showing this wonderful continuity between Ruskin and Gandhi, demonstrating that years apart, the two great thinkers were walking, indeed, hand in hand. This sense of a companionship of souls and similarity of vision brings us back to Ruskin's early prose writings, where he explains how setting one's heart and mind to a manual task allows us to perceive the world around us with the eyes of an artist. So I'm reading now from an essay from 1838, which, as Laurent says, is Ruskin speaking about seeing with the eye of an artist. Let two persons go out for a walk, the one a good sketcher, the other having no taste of the kind. Let them go down a green lane. There will be a great difference in the scene as perceived by the two individuals. The one will see a lane and trees. He will perceive the trees to be green, though he will think nothing about it. He will see that the sun shines and that it has a cheerful effect, but that the trees make the lane shady and cool. And he will see an old woman in a red cloak, a voila too. But what will the sketcher see? His eye is accustomed to search into the cause of beauty and penetrate the minutest parts of loveliness. He looks up 
and observes how the showery and subdivided sunshine comes sprinkled down among the gleaming leaves overhead till the air is filled with the emerald light and the motes dance in the green glittering lines that shoot down upon the thicker masses of clustered foliage that stand out so bright and beautiful from the dark retiring shadows of the inner tree where the white light again comes flashing in from behind like showers of stars and here and there a bough is seen emerging from the veil of leaves of a hundred varied colours where the old and gnarled wood is covered with brightness the dual brightness of the emerald moss or the variegated and fantastic lichens, white and blue, purple and red, all mellowed and mingled into a garment of beauty from the old withered branch. Then come the cavernous trunks, and the twisted roots that grasp with their snake-like coils at the steep bank, whose turfy slope is inlaid with flowers of a thousand dyes, each with his diadem of dew. And down like a visiting angel looks one ray of golden light, and passes over the glittering turf, kiss, kiss, kissing every blossom, until the laughing flowers have lighted up the lips of the grass with one bright and beautiful smile that is seen far, far away among the shadows of the old trees, like a gleam of summer lightning along the darkness of an evening cloud. Is not this worth seeing? Yet, if you are not a sketcher, you will pass along the green lane, and when you come home again, have nothing to say or to think about it, but that you went down such and such a lane. Thank you so much, Tess, for reading these exquisite instances of visual painting or visual writing that are so characteristic of Ruskin's prose. This invitation to perceive and decipher the natural world using references to craft um, as you know, um, is taken up again in a couple of didactic texts that are very different and that will now be read. One of them being the ethics of the dust and the other one, the elements of drawing. The ethics of the dust is one of Ruskin's strangest and most fascinating texts. It is a semi-fictionalized dramatization of lessons he gave to schoolgirls at the very progressive Winnington Hall in Cheshire, with himself as the old lecturer and the girls given pseudonyms. When we join them, the old lecturer has been teaching the schoolgirls about rocks and crystals, how they are shaped and formed, and has flowed into a discussing the crystals as allegories for human types and generations and the passing of ages. Tomorrow is to be kept for questions and difficulties. Let us keep to the plain facts today. There is yet one group of facts connected with this rending of the rocks, which I especially want you to notice. You know, when you have mended a very old dress, quite meritoriously, till it won't mend any more. Could not you sometimes stick to gentleman's work to illustrate by? Gentlemen's work is rarely so useful as yours, Egypt, and when it is useful, girls cannot easily understand it. I am sure we should understand it better than gentlemen understand about sewing. My dear, I hope I always speak modestly and under correction when I touch upon matters of the kind too high for me. And besides, I never intend to speak otherwise than respectfully of sewing, though you always seem to think I am laughing at you. In all seriousness, 
illustrations from sewing are those which Neath likes me best to use, and which young ladies ought to like everybody to use. What do you think the beautiful word wife comes from? I don't think it is a particularly beautiful word. <laughs> Perhaps not. At your ages, you may think bride sounds better, but wife's the word for wear. Depend upon it. It is the great word in which the English and Latin languages conquer the French and the Greek. I hope the French will someday get a word for it. Yet, instead of their dreadful thumb, but what do you think it comes from? I never did think about it. Nor you, Sybil? No, I thought it was Saxon and stopped there. Yes, but the great good of Saxon words is that they usually do mean something. Wife means weaver. You have all the right to call yourselves little housewives when you sew neatly. But I don't think we want to call ourselves little housewives. You must either be housewives or house moths. Remember that in the deep sense. You must either weave men's fortunes and embroider them or feed upon and bring them to decay. You had better let me keep my sewing illustration and help me out with it. Well, we'll hear it under protest. You have heard it before, but with reference to other matters. When it is said, no man putteth a, new, a piece of new cloth on an old garment, else it taketh from the old. Does it not mean that the new piece tears the old one away at the sewn edge? Yes, certainly. And when you mend a decayed stuff with strong thread, does not the whole edge come away sometimes when it tears again? Yes, and then it's of no use to mend it any more. Well, the rocks don't seem to think that, but the same thing happens to them continually. I told you, they were full of rents or veins. Large masses of rock are sometimes as full of veins as your hand is, and of the veins nearly as fine. Only, you know a rock vein does not mean a tube, but a crack or a cleft. Now, these clefts are mended, usually, with the strongest material the rock can find, and often literally with threads. For gradually opening rent seems to draw the substance it is filled with into fibres, which cross from one side of it to the other, and are partly crystalline, so that when the crystals become distinct, the fissure has often exactly the look of a tear wrought together with strong cross stitches. Now, when this is completely done and all has been fastened and made firm, perhaps some new change of temperature may occur and the rock begin to contract again. Then the old vein must open wider or else another open elsewhere. If the old vein widen, it may do so at its center, but it constantly happens with well-filled veins that the cross stitches are too strong to break. The walls of the vein instead are torn away by them. And another little supplementary vein, often three or four successfully, will thus be formed at the side of the first. That is really very much like our work. We're moving on now to an exercise from the elements of drawing in which Ruskin instructs the complete beginner in how to draw a tree with attention and precision. He also refers back to an earlier exercise in drawing letters. And I chose this passage 
as an example of what I find very helpful in Ruskin's teaching, which is his own attention to detail and precise instruction. He believes that through drawing, we learn to see and to understand what we are seeing, and that this is the essential foundation to becoming an artist in any medium. I also personally find it very encouraging that earlier in this text, Ruskin states, I have never yet in all the experiments I have made met with a person who could not learn to draw at all. Choose any tree that you think pretty, which is nearly bare of leaves and which you can see against the sky or against a pale wall or other light ground. It must not be against strong light or you will find the looking at it hurts your eyes. Nor must it be in sunshine or you will be puzzled by the lights on the boughs. But the tree must be in shade and the sky blue or gray or dull white. A holy gray or rainy day is the best for this practice. You will see that all the boughs of the tree are dark against the sky. Consider them as so many dark rivers to be laid down in a map with absolute accuracy and without the least thought about the roundness of the stems, map them all out in flat shade, scrawling them in with pencil, just as you did the limbs of your letters. Then correct and alter them, rubbing out and out again, never minding how much your paper is dirtied, only not destroying its surface. Until every bow is exactly or as near as your utmost power can bring it, right in curvature and in thickness. Look at the white interstices between them with as much scrupulousness as if they were little estates which you had to survey and draw maps of for some important lawsuit involving heavy penalties if you cut the least bit of a corner off any of them or give the hedge anywhere too deep a curve. And try continually to fancy the whole tree, nothing but a flat ramification on a white ground. Do not take any trouble about the little twigs, which look like a confused network or mist. Leave them all out, drawing only the main branches as far as you can see them distinctly. Your object at present being not to draw a tree, but to learn how to do so. Elsewhere, Ruskin said, the imagination must be fed constantly by external nature. Trees feature frequently in my own textiles, and I find it's always helpful to start by drawing, paying attention to detail, as Ruskin teaches, to the overall shape and branching pattern of each species and the form of individual trees. Even though they will be an interpretation rather than a precise reproduction, the trees that I go on to stitch will have in them what Ruskin calls the memory of nature. From sketching to stitching, from training to teaching. This group of readings has aimed to show the multiple ramifications of Ruskin's thought on textile. And I'm sure you saw that the running thread or fil rouge um, of his aesthetics and ethical stance was indeed textile and fabric. Detailed attention to nature and others as individual threads of a larger whole. As if stitch stitching, Drawing and writing were all different, but interconnected ways of being together and telling one's story. And I would like to conclude with these lines from Modern Painters, where Ruskin writes, The power, therefore, 
of thus fully perceiving any natural object depends on our being able to group and fasten all our fences about it as a center, making a garland of thoughts for it, in which each separate thought is subdued and shortened of its own strength in order to fit it for harmony with others. The intensity of our enjoyment of the object depending first on its own beauty and then on the richness of the garland. Thank you for your attention and thank you to all the marvelous speakers. Thank you so much, Laurence, and indeed all our speakers, just as you said, not least Arjun, for whom it is now well past midnight uh, in India, where he is. And can I um, thank you for your close attention and on behalf of everybody, express my appreciation. It's fascinating how the tone is different with each session. The subject is different and somehow different things emerge in Ruskin's tone, in his approach, in how he, I'm very struck that often he seems in his mind's eye to be talking very consciously to women first for men in many of the readings chosen today. That may be, forgive me, the Ruskin scholars among you will correct me, but that sense that he's engaging consciously with different audiences um, and weaving these threads and then you in turn with your choices of um, the readings have in turn then woven your own thoughts and perspectives and uh, cultural perspectives I would include in that and I was very moved also by that notion that Arjun you touched on that the flag of India has a faint imprint of the impact that Ruskin had on Gandhi um, which in this time of complex empires and imperialism and so on is, is fascinating in itself. I'm aware that my internet is very poor and unstable, and so I'm not going to keep talking, driving you all mad, but really to ask if anybody has any reflection they would like to add uh, as we finish, please feel free either to write it into the chat. Thank you, Michelle, uh, for writing what you have. Um, <clears throat> but if anybody wants to um, briefly unmute and just comment or reflect, please feel free to do so before we bring the call to an end. Equally, there's absolutely no obligation to do so. And indeed, if any of the speakers want to reflect on the experience of listening to yourselves and each other and reflecting on what the evening collectively has has meant for you, then please feel free to do so. As I reach behind myself and grab an item, I like having props. You've already noticed by pulling out my spindle earlier and now a little booklet. You saw this show up on one of the slides and it is one of the objects that was produced by the Langdale Linen Industry where they made the book and you know, the fabric is linen that's woven and along the principles of not polluting the landscape they talk about it in the introduction in terms of you know bleaching with the sun and the dew rather than using um, chemicals to produce you know, um, noxious elements and so it's really fascinating sort of the tangible objects that remain and across the slides most of the images you saw, although there's a few exceptions, but most were either from the Guild of St. George's collection or were examples of Tessa's embroidery woven in along the way. And so again, that sort of sense of the richness that we have in terms of objects to inspire and think about. Uh I'd just like to say what a wonderful marriage of images and voices we had this evening. It struck me when Tess was reading her piece, which begins, but what will the sketcher see? And it goes on about foliage, 
and the inner tree and the white light and so on. It could almost have been written specially for her. It was so apt and it was so lovely to see examples of her work on the screen as she was reading. But the variety between your voices, the beautiful way everyone read and the complementarity of the images and the words, it was really very moving and very lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And as this series of four readings is your brainchild, um, that's lovely to hear. <laughs> and perhaps on that note, I will uh, remind everybody that the next in the series will be at the same time, 5.45 for 6 p.m. on Friday, the 17th of February. This time uh, inspired by Ruskin's writings about what nowadays we call mixed media, but with a particular focus because of the wonderful speakers we have gathered on glass, plastering and silversmithing and convened by a new companion of the Guild, Nicholas Mander, who I'm delighted to see has joined us this evening. The Zoom link for that event will be on the events page on the Guild website, where I will also next week place a link to a recording of this evening's session. And we will also publicize it on the Guild's various social media channels. And can I um, emphasize that if you've enjoyed the reading this evening and plan to come yourself to the next one, do please spread the word. Let people know that there is an hour or so of glorious prose that's read to you for free by people who are passionate about Ruskin and his great understandings that are so timeless and wonderful to be shared. And on that note, thank you to those of you who are leaving lovely appreciation um, in the chat. And I just will read out one of them from Melanie. We need to reabsorb these past experiences to our economy in some ways. Which I'm going to end the recording now and invite you uh, in your own time to leave the call.